Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana on a Saturday morning uh, in mid-April. And this is our class that introduces the new collection of fig trees that we grow every year. So we start figs from cuttings every winter, and by this time of year, they're marginally ready. So if you buy a fig that looks like this, we're pretty sure it's got roots on it when the leaves are this large and it already went through a, a week that we actually hit 80 degrees this last week. So if the leaves haven't wilted and died, that means they usually have decent roots. But uh, generally, I would say leave them in the pot, especially black plastic. It's warmer in here. The roots grow faster until they're about at least a foot tall. Maybe, maybe not quite as tall as these. These are about 18 inches to two foot tall. But by the time they're about a foot tall, then the roots should be well developed and you can pull them out of these pots without ruining the root system. Um, now, if I was a larger nursery, I would have, because we do about 500 or more cuttings every year, I would say this year, maybe 600 cuttings we would try to hide these from our customers until they were truly ready, but our facility is quite small and it's hard to hide things here. So they're all exposed. People are buying them because they see the names on them. They want to get these um, varieties that are not available at most nurseries, although you know these are quite well known uh, on the internet, uh, and get them. And uh, we hate to say, no, they're not ready yet, so we'll say, okay, you can buy them, uh, leave them in the pot until they're about a foot tall. And that might take one to two months, depending on the heat. So one of the problems we have, so this is 2024, the weather this year seems to be pretty normal. This year, more normal. Last year, uh, coolest year we had in at least a dozen years um and the figs you know from last year only grew about one to two foot whereas uh 10 years ago 2014 it was a year with no winter and the figs and it was so warm those years that the figs trees would grow five to seven foot in one year from a cutting so yeah we've had some trouble with the cooling climate um, we're supposed to be warming up, but 2014-15 uh, uh, seemed to be our hottest winters, and now we're going the other way again, where we're back to a normal or cool winter. And last year was really cool. So, uh, so normally, most of these guys, we expect them to fruit this year. By August, September, they should be making fruit. Uh, last year, hardly any fruit formed on any of the fig trees. It was just a cool year. Whereas the older, more established trees made a few fruit, but certainly not anything that we were used to 10 years ago. So now figs originated apparently in Eastern Asia. That seems to be the location. And man, 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, who, who knows how long ago, were eating figs, the wild figs. And they were one of them. Apparently the first tree that men cultivated. In other words, they found a good fig, they would grab it out of the ground or tear a branch off, take it with them when they move their their colony or their little uh, tribe and replant them. So they have evidence 5,000 years ago of men moving and cultivating fig trees. So it has been under cultivation a long time. It's The hot center point now is is around the Mediterranean Ocean where a lot of figs are grown. Um, and our climate here in California is usually as good as you can get for figs. Now, truthfully, if we lived in Riverside or Fresno or the inland areas, you know, further than 20 miles from the coast, uh, they do a bit better. Here on the coast, we get like today is totally clouded over, but that happened last year all summer long. The ocean fog would move in and prevent the fig trees from really doing their thing. 
um, the further inland you are, the less that happens. And figs like to be, you know, between 90 and 100 degrees all summer long. If that make them really happy. So here along the coast, we do have to pick and choose a, a bit to avoid the figs that need it hot all the time. And there are some we'll mention for you. So, okay, um, for growing figs, what figs do is when they're growing leaves and they've been growing for a while, they will put on a, so these trees early in the year aren't strong enough yet, but as they grow older or they start really taking off with leaves, say here's a, now this, this is a fig growing in a pot. The problem with figs in pots, especially when the weather's cool, is this ground in here gets as cold as it does at night in the air. So they're a little slower to get going. Whereas if you have a fig in the ground, especially if it's near a house, they've been growing now for a few months because the ground is warmer than the soil in a pot. And also if you're near the, uh, a building, which this one was right next to a home, it's warm there. The roots are warm. Uh, we find that figs that are close to warm areas, either in the ground or near a building, often stay evergreen here and ever producing on top of that. We have seen that. So 2014, 2015, or 2013, 2014, real warm winters, a lot of our fig trees, even in pots, did not lose their leaves those winters, and they just kept on producing fruit through the winter. Now we have had one customer who's who lives part-time here in Orange or in Santa Ana, California, and he also lives half the year in the Philippines. He goes back and forth. He's taken some of the figs that we think are deciduous trees and taken the Philippines. He says in the Philippines they're evergreen and ever producing. They don't stop. Now, he said the problem with figs in the Philippines is if they have a real bad monsoonal season and it, does, and it keeps raining for an entire month, all leaves get sick and they all drop off. And if they have a really bad monsoonal season, they lose their fig trees. They just give up when they can't grow a healthy leaf. So figs are very sensitive to wet leaves. Every time we get a rainstorm in the summer here, they get spots all over the leaves that cause them to uh, drop off, turn slowly die and drop off. They, of course, here it doesn't rain that continuously, especially in the summertime, and they just grow new leaves and they're fine again. But any rainstorm that's decent, like last year we did have an inch or two of rain in August. Uh, we noticed that a lot of the leaves got spotted and they started dropping off. And customers are calling up and worried about their trees dropping leaves. Now here again, <clears throat> our air is relatively dry, so that usually stops. If you're in the deep south and you're trying to grow figs there, which is not really their climate where you get all that summer rain, they can be in big trouble. They can get all spotted up. I'm sure there's some fungicides that'll stop that, or you can just, you know, throw them underneath the patio roof, something like that, to stop them, especially if they're in a container. So that's one thing that figs like, is they like a dry, warm summer, which we often are here. You are typically, we're dry in the summertime here. So that helps out. So <clears throat> on figs, so you know that there's several kinds of figs. We grow the ones that are female. All these here are female, and they make fruit all by themselves with no pollination needed. Now, there is a famous fig that requires pollination called the Smyrna fig. In California, this is often called Calamurna. Same thing, though. Smyrna figs are, are famous in Portugal and Spain. They're really large flat figs, light colored. Now figs have an eye at the bottom of the fruit. On this developing fig here, you can see a little circle or a little 
dot there, that's the eye of the fig. Um, on some figs, this eye is an open hole. On others, it's very tight and closed. Most figs are somewhere in between. So the Calamerna fig or a Smyrna fig requires to be pollinated by a different fig, or else this fig, as it develops, just turns yellow and falls off. And when these figs were first brought to California, the Portuguese farmers failed to tell them that they needed a wasp pollinator. So for about five years, the farmers in California, uh, this was over 100 years ago, were growing the Smyrna fig and no crop. So they went back to Portugal and asked them, what's going on here? And they kind of admitted they didn't tell them on purpose, I guess, that they needed another type of fig that grows the pollinator. So there are things called capra figs. And capra figs are figs that not only have the edible parts of it, like the Smyrna fig, but they also have uh, stamens, the male part of the flower. So figs essentially are inside-out flower with the flower parts pointing inside the fruit and covered on the outside with the skin. Capra figs have both the female part and the male parts in the figs, so they do have stamens with pollen on them inside their figs. So you'll have a fig if you cut it open on the inside, you'll see the female parts, and then you'll see the male kind of hair-like things inside the fruit with the pollen on it. And there's actually a little wasp that lives in here. The larvae, which look like little worms, eat the pollen. Uh, they pupate, turn into little wasps and they fly out carrying the pollen with them and they'll find another fig. In this case, there's no pollen in here so they can't live in there, but they're searching for, well, these are male wasps flying around searching for female wasps to mate with and in the same instance, they will pollinate this Calamerna fig and it then develops. Now the problem is you have to have two orchards. With this fig, you have to have two orchards. You have to have a fig growing the Smyrna figs and a different orchard far away growing the capra figs because what they have found out is if you have too much pollen from these figs going into these fruit, the fruit gets too big and it, and it cracks open. So <clears throat> they found out that when the time is right and when these figs are starting to develop on the capra figs, they bring in a whole bunch of these figs here with the male wasp in them and he put, they said they put 13 in a basket underneath each tree, and that'll be the right amount of pollen to pollinate these Smyrna figs and get them the right size. So the Smyrna figs have developing seeds inside them. Most of the other figs, trees, we think they have seeds too, but they're not as like the, the Smyrna figs, which are somewhat crunchy. You don't notice them as much as you hear them. So if you eat a Smyrna fig, and you'll find a lot of these dried, like at local stores, they have some dried Calamerna or Smyrna figs. Uh, I believe Trader Joe's carries these. And when you eat them, uh, they have this slight crunch in your ear, which is kind of neat. You don't, you can feel a slight crunch when you're eating them, but that's the seeds. They're soft seeds, but they have this crunchiness to them, almost like Rice Krispies crunch. And uh, it's a nice sensation. So Smyrna fig is considered perhaps the top quality fig in the world. That's the reason they do this pollination biz. But generally we don't, uh, in a home you can't do that. So we generally offer just the figs that don't require pollination um, and they'll make fruit no matter what. So the figs we have are, are self-fertile females. There's a name for that, and I forget the, the scientific name for that one. So figs um, grow on new growth, and usually by summer, every single leaf that makes 
that the tree makes has a little fig attached to it. If the plant's strong enough, every leaf will have a fig at the base of it. None of these show it yet. It's, it's too early in the year. Uh, so they need a few months of warm weather. Now, what happens is in the fall, as the weather gets colder, they're still making leaves with little figs at the base of them, but if we get too cold, well, we always get too cold, the leaves fall off, and that little fig bud is still there waiting for next year. And that's your spring crop. So it's they make them the same way, but there's no fig attached, no, no leaf attached to that one. So this one was a fig that started developing last fall, just a little bud, and it couldn't get going until it got warm this year. You can see there's no leaf right attached to it. There's leaf up here, leaf right here. But this was attached to a, the top leaf last year, and now it's growing this year. And this is your what is called the Braba crop, the spring crop. Usually there's not many because there's not many figs. A lot of the figs that were starting to develop last fall just fail, get too cold, drop off. But a few of them are the right size, about pea size, and they make it till the next year. Here On this branch, this was a fig in a pot, so it's just starting to grow. You can see a little bread crop fig here. So this one made it through the winter, and it'll form this spring. And here's another one right here. And I see a third one right here. So your spring crop on this branch will be at least three. Boy, here's another one here. So there's quite a few little figs on here at the end of this branch that if I hadn't cut it off would finish developing into uh, now, usually the spring figs, because there's so few of them, are larger and sometimes better quality than the main crop, which is summer, fall. But you generally don't get much, and if you don't, and if you trim off all your branches short in the winter, which most of us do to control size, you lose all this. But again, it's just a few figs compared to what you get summer, fall, typically. So you can see on this branch. Um, there are scars where the leaves were attached. So these big light colored or different colored spots are where the leaves are attached. And above each where the leaves are attached, there's the growth bud there, a little bud that can grow. And on this one, the leaf scar is below where the new growth is coming out. So this will form a new branch coming out that after it grows a foot or so or more, it'll start making figs on that branch, and it'll do that as long as it can throughout the year. Now, when you're cutting figs back, just know that they can make the best. They generally always make fruit off of wood that grew last year. So on this particular tree, this entire branch here grew last year. You can see it's a little different colored than this down here. So this grew last year. Any branch growing off of this one will make fruit. And generally, they can, and even wood from two years ago, which may be this piece here, even a branch from here might make fruit off of it. But if you cut this down to, this is probably four-year-old wood down here, any branch that grows off a of four-year-old wood would grow, but not make any fruit that year. So if you cut your fig trees too severely down to older wood, you have less chance of getting fruit off of that growth that year, although a year later, that branch that grew would, would, would sprout branches that made fruit on them again. So one of the strategies, now we're in a part of the country where figs typically grow very fast. So at my own house, uh, a lot of my fig trees will grow 10, even 15 foot in one year. And if you save that, the next year it's 10 or 15 foot taller than that. You can't reach any of the fruit. So what we tend to do, so if you have a, say a lot of my, the older figs have a real big trunk at the bottom, and then you'll see branches that just sky and grow straight up or arch out so they go straight up. This is the growth for the year. They're making figs up here. They can be 10 or 15 foot taller than 
the ground. So we do that winter after the figs are done is we'll cut them down within a few inches of where they started. So we're leaving a little bit of the current this year's growth on the tree with a few nodes of growth on them. Each place where leaf is attached is called a node. And at where each leaf attaches, there's a bud for future growth. So we'll cut them down to one or two nodes left on each of these branches. And then the following year, it'll grow one or two branches from what you've left that also have figs on them. So in an old fig orchard, especially in warmer climates, you'll see a big stump in the ground, and it'd be quite big, with short branches on the top of it that are year-old branches. And every year, these things would take off and grow. Figs from about here all the way up to the tip. Now, they'll, they'll put out a few side branches, too, and if you leave the short side branches, those are the branches you can probably save for next year's rubber crop if that's what you want. On some figs, the rubber crop is significantly larger than the regular crop up here, which is smaller fruited, and as we go in further and further into the fall and winter, then the fruit tends to get smaller and smaller. Generally, our, our heaviest crop on most years is late August through October here. That's when you expect most figs to uh, be eating. But, uh, you know, two years ago, we had a really early spring. It was 80 degrees in February and 100 degrees in April. And we had a lot of figs ripening in June that year. So every year is different. I mean, our weather seems to have changed back to what it used to be before. So apparently the climatologists have said between the 1950s and around 2000, our weather was typical where it was, you know, you had winter and then you had a nice mild spring and then you had a warm summer. Uh, but before that, they said we had some really wild weather in the 1920s and 1930s. The hottest temperatures ever recorded were in the 1930s. It was just going back and forth. We had snowfall in the 40s uh, in L.A. So it was real wild. And we seem to be going back to that pattern where we get these very wide swings. Like earlier this week, it was 80. Today, it might hopefully break 65. <laughs> So we'll see what happens. Not going to try to predict the weather this year, but uh, this year does feel a little more normal. So, Okay, so we did mention one disease, uh, which is a least spot disease they get in the rain. That one we don't worry about much when we get it. We, we just let it happen. We don't, we don't like to spray fungicide on our edible crops, so we just leave it alone, let it happen, uh, and they usually recover from that. Another disease that you'll see a lot of is the one that this tree shows. So on the new growth on this tree, it's got some weird shaped leaves, and this one here you can see is mottled, terribly mottled in color. Some, some figs that get this will have big splashes of white on them or no color areas but it's but it's also so this one got model leaves misshapen leaves now truthfully figs can make two shapes of leaves and you can see on this branch uh, this is kind of a typical shape leaf that's in three parts this one's in three parts but this one is just in an entire leaf, just one big, this, they often call these the shovel leaves, and these are more maple leaves, and we even have some that make kind of a snowflake leaf, and it seems to us, or to most observers, that the younger genetically the tree is, the more the leaves are deeply cut like snowflakes. Here's another one. Actually, that was the same variety. So this, we know, is a relatively recently grown fig tree, maybe discovered 20 years ago. And the leaves are very deep cut. We call them snowflake leaves. 
whereas some of the old varieties um, are known for having the shovel leaf, the non-divided leaves. So it could be a, a, a something that happens as they get genetically older. I'm sure some of these varieties are hundreds of years old. So figs get viruses pretty easily. There's a microscopic mite, aerified mite, that spreads this disease, unfortunately. It's easy to catch it. Most figs have it in them. Fortunately, too, most viruses do not like hot weather. So just like us, you get a virus, you get a fever, the fever cooks the virus and, and kills it, essentially. And on figs, it doesn't maybe not get, doesn't get rid of it in the plant system, but it makes it not, so you don't notice it anymore. So by summer, if we have a regular warm uh, spring, these leaves will all look normal after that without the modeling, modeling to them. You don't even notice it anymore. Uh, there's other ways to take viruses out of plants. One is to, one thing they have done in the past is put a plant in an oven and keep it at 107 degrees for 72 hours and that usually frees the virus up. Or you can tissue culture plant. When you tissue culture plant, you're taking just single cells out of the growth tips where there's no circulation yet and the viruses haven't reached that area yet. So there are companies that are tissue culturing figs so that they're clean. Um, the problem is, is that these mites are blowing around in the wind and your chances of catching the virus again are pretty high. So if there's a disease fig around, um, you know, it'll probably transfer it eventually to the clean fig trees, put it that way. So it's hard to keep the viruses out. Again, the viruses typically don't cause it to be non-productive or anything like that. They just make it ugly and, and uh, slow developing in the spring. So we don't like the viruses, but there's not a whole lot you can do about them in our climate. If you had them in the greenhouse isolated, they may never catch it. Yeah, so we have bought, we bought one set of tissue cultured figs and a lot of those figs that we bought six or seven years ago still haven't fruited. <laughs> They're acting like seedlings. So seedling figs, a lot of times they'll sit there and look like, you know, they have usually have really skinny branches and leaves that are very snowflake-like, and they sit there and grow like a, like a little mound on the ground for quite a number of years before they start to get bigger and start making fruit. Um, so that it, yeah, they may, that's the problem we see with a lot of the tissue culture fig trees is they act like babies again. When they're doing tissue culture, they have to put hormones on them that make them juvenile to grow roots and grow stems and leaves from the cells that they have. And we think that's, that can, you know, certain varieties just may take forever to start fruiting again. So we'd rather grow them from cuttings off of established fruiting trees than tissue culture. Tissue culture, again, can clean out the viruses, and from one cell you can make thousands and thousands of trees. So it's a faster way to reproduce a fig tree, but uh, we're a little worried about how long it takes for them to fruit. Now, we've seen some of them start fruiting within a couple years, but we still have a few at our store that are you know, in containers that still look like the year we got them where they're just growing like little skinny stems with small leaves and and not getting anywhere so okay um the major problem we have right now is there's a new bug in town so the main problem we've had before this was the big green fruit beetles so there is a large beetle that flies around in, uh, in Orange County. I haven't seen it in so much in parts of LA County, but in Orange County, there is this beetle that's 
perhaps this, I mean, it looks bigger in person than it does when I draw it. So it's, it's a scarab type beetle. It's got, it's mostly green. It fly, when it flies around, <clears throat> it sounds like a little hummingbird flying around and it zooms around. It's a clumsy flyer. I mean, you just catch them. They can't bite you. They can eat, they don't eat soft things like fig, ripe figs, uh, overripe grapes, uh, things that are really soft, uh, rose petals. So, but it's, that's called a, well, it's got several names, but green fruit beetle is how we like to call it, or fig beetle. And they can eat all the overripe figs on your tree, and if they don't have any overripe figs to eat, they'll eat the ripe ones too. Now, a friend of mine made a trap to catch his fig beetles, and he says it works quite well. So they're attracted to the smell of overripe fruit, or most so what he does, he gets a bottle like this, cuts off the top, inverts it, so the, and puts grape juice down here. And he showed me a picture of it, texted me a picture of it. Every day he collects about 20 to 30 fig beetles. They, they, they can fit through the hole in here, but they can't fly out. Plus, he's got the grape juice in the bomb, so they're just floating in the grape juice, and they just drown and die. Uh, and he gets about, uh, he said, about 30 a day. The larvae of the fig beetles live in the ground eating fungus. So if you have a compost pile, you have these big white grubs in there with red heads. That's the larvae of these. They don't really eat roots so much as they eat fungus in the ground. And, but when they come out of the ground, they fly around looking for soft, sweet things to eat. Um, but this is one way you can catch them. He hangs this with the, in his tree where the figs are, and he collects them that way. So that's one way to do it. <clears throat> they catch a lot of beetles that way of different kinds. But now there's <clears throat> a more serious pest and that's been in the Mediterranean area for probably since figs got there, this is the black fig fly. So this made it from Europe or the Mediterranean area to Mexico and South America a number of years ago and a nursery in Ventura uh, started getting them, I think it was two years ago or maybe three years ago now. And people who bought figs from that nursery then transported all throughout California so that um, um, everybody has them now. We get, we've seen a few of them here at the nursery. Now the black fig fly is a type of fruit fly, so they're small, maybe smaller than that. The bodies are black, they have red eyes. You, I've never seen one, but we see the damage. So what they do is, when the figs are anywhere from a quarter inch to fully developed, they will go into the fig through the eye of the fig. They lay their eggs right in the eye of the fig, and the larva burrow through the flesh. Now fortunately, most of these figs never fully develop. They'll just turn yellow, drop off, and you won't be surprised when you eat one. Um, occasionally they'll go after a, a well-developed fig and you'll actually find a few worms there. So now whenever we eat a fig, we break it open to make sure there's nothing moving in there or no discoloration. But most of the figs that they're in will then drop off the tree. They leave a little exit hole. The larvae don't usually pupate inside, although they can. We've found some pupa inside the fruit but they leave a small BB-sized hole where they drop out of the fig and they pupate in the dirt in the ground normally. Now, if you grow them in a pot, you can cover the pot with plastic so they can't pupate there and multiply. At our growing ground, we're on plastic ground cover cloth. So that's, we think that's helping keeping the fruit fly, the black fruit fly population down, in fact, 
that there's so few areas where they can actually pupate. Uh, so we get hit, you know, usually once in the spring and then the rest of the year we're clean. So that's one way, hopefully, we can treat it. The other way that they have done in Europe, because in Europe they've been, they said if you don't treat the fig flies, and of course Europe, they're all over the place, around the Mediterranean region, they said you can lose 75% of your crop to this bug. So, it, you know, until, up until now, we never had a problem. So figs have been really easy up until now. And now that this fig flies here, so in Europe, they, they do this. They get these little organza bags. You can buy them at, um, at craft stores. And you put one over each fruit. When it's just big enough to get this over it, so like this fruit seems to be on, nothing's happened to that one yet. And you put this little bag over it, the fly can't get in there. Now, there's a lot of people trying to come up with a way to just plug the hole with a drop of glue or some museum um, paste or whatever you call that stuff, gel or something. Uh, so far, little stickers haven't worked because as the fruit grows, there's a little gap there and the fly finds it and gets in it. So it's got to be something that adheres tightly to the hole. Um, now, the other option we'll have is that they make these things, big bags, like six-foot bags. You can put them over the entire branch. Now, if, you have, if you're growing a, a fig that needs the wasp pollination, that won't help. But if the most figs don't need that wasp pollination, you can just cover the entire tree with this bag. Sunlight can get in there. Bugs can't. And that would keep all those figs uh, clean, too. Now, hopefully, most of you are growing in areas where the black fig fly isn't there yet, so you just grow them for a while and see how you do. They're not over the entire, you know, they're not in every city in, in this area in California yet, but they're, they're traveling. <clears throat> now, the universities are, of course, uh, looking for ways to treat because there are commercial fig orchards in California. And there's this bait, I think it's called GF250, uh, which they think will work. So they're still working on this. Um, what that is, is it's, it's a sugar bait. So they're attracted to sugary things. And they put spinosad in it. So this is a, a kind of a fruity, sugary bait that has spinosad, which is an organic bait uh, pesticide that kills chewing things. So they combine that with the, the bait and that kills the flies. Uh, nothing kills the larva once they're inside the fruit. So you're trying to control the adult. So we'll see. I've seen this online. Um, now they, it, you know, right now it's just being sold for olives for certain things to get uh, fruit flies in them. So olives, about ten years ago, got this olive fruit fly that came from the Mediterranean. Also, so they had to make products that would stop the olive fruit fly and other fruit flies. So this is out there. It's sold, being sold in gallons for like two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> so we don't recommend that any retail. A homeowner's buy it yet. We'll see um, if it's going to be necessary. But that's a bait that you can spray and the flies land on it. They eat a bit of it and it kills them. You'll have less attacking your fruit. It's not going to stop 100% of it, but it will make it less. So that's the new bug in town that's the real nasty one. There's not much else besides birds and rats and squirrels. Um, now birds, this was back in the 1980s. I had 30 fig trees in my backyard and in August, September, it sounded like an aviary back there. Just so many birds. So I happen to have a really realistic looking rubber snake. And I heard that birds don't like snakes. So I just threw it on the tree 
And for two weeks, I heard no birds. It, it, it just kept away for a long time. So the snakes have worked better than the owl scarecrows and the sparrow scarecrows or the uh, hawk scarecrows. Um, so the snake has worked better. So we do still sell a beach ball material plastic blow-up snake. This is a six-foot snake. You just throw it on top of the tree when the fruit's ripening. And then the birds stay away for quite a while. Doesn't work forever. I mean, if you keep moving this every day, every day, they think it will be real. That might keep way longer. But I didn't move mine ever, and it worked for about two weeks. Um, there are squirrels. That's tough. They they don't they're not scared of much. Now the one thing good about figs, compared to like if you have a peach tree. The one advantage of a peach tree is if you have a decent sized peach tree, they'll have 200 ripe fruit all at one time. And the birds and the squirrels can't eat them all at once. So even if you lose half your crop to a bird, the birds and squirrels and rodents, you've got lots of fruit that you still pick and eat. The nice thing about figs and the bad thing about figs is they'll often ripen you know, a good sized fig tree one fruit every day for months and months and months. And if you have a real hungry rodent or squirrel or birds, they can get every single one of those. So that's the advantage and disadvantage of figs is you get a few figs over a long period of time. Of course, if you have a whole fig orchard, you have enough fig trees, you'll keep the birds busy. They won't have, they'll have too much to eat. But if you just have a few fig trees, uh, they can get every single one of them. So, um, the orchards may not have to worry as much about keeping the, the, the pests off their tree just because they have so many trees. Fertilizer-wise, uh, figs and pots do need fertilizer. If they don't get it, they don't grow. If they don't grow, they don't get many figs. Um, so pots generally have to fertilize constantly, especially during the growing season. Figs in the ground, I generally don't fertilize them. So in the, when they're in the ground, they seem to be able to find their own fertilizer. Figs have very fast-growing, extensive root systems. I think they'll just find a place in your garden where you are fertilizing, like a lawn or something, and take the food out of there. But uh, I rarely fertilize figs in the ground, and there's a lot of wild figs that grow from seeds dropped by birds that come up, and they just take off and grow like weeds without any help at all. So. Now we mentioned we grow the uh, female, fertile female figs. If you get those seedlings, so um, if there's any fig trees in the area, the birds eat the fruit, they sit on the walls and eat the fruit, and they also poop next to the walls. So many yards you'll see fig trees growing along all the walls. So, and that's where most of the new varieties come from, is figs poop out the seeds or they drop seeds when they're eating the fruit and they start growing long fences. And across California, you'll see fig trees growing next to walls. And you know those are volunteer figs. So for a while I was growing, well, I've grown a lot of those volunteer figs to see how they turned out. And half of them seem to have to be Capra figs, the ones with the male pollen, and so you can't really eat them. They take they're dry, textured because of you got the pollen and the anthers in them. Uh, so they call those the goat figs because only goats eat those things. And then about half of them were the female figs, also. And of, of the female figs that I've grown, half of those were decent. The other half were marginally flavored but you always have to look at them because there's some figs that you, you know i had one customer say well we have this volunteer fig tree but the figs don't taste very good and i said well bring one in i, I want to try it myself and see what it looks like so they brought me these figs now most volunteer figs tend to be green uh decent size i cut it open 
waited for about 30 seconds, and then the entire inside of the fig started moving, wiggling around. So, you know, this is one of those capra figs with the wasp larvae living in them. I said, no, don't eat these. <laughs> so, you have to be careful with the volunteer figs. You know, you, you cut them in half and watch them for a while, see if anything starts moving in them. So... No, no. Generally, each volunteer fig tree is what it is. So it's either a self-fertile female, can be a Smyrna type that needs pollination. Uh, it can be um, a Capra fig, which has the male parts in it too. Uh, there may be more things than that because this fig that they brought in was a female fig, but it had the um, larva of the wasp in it. So that's different too. It might have been a capra fig. I, this was back in the 80s, and I don't recall the full details. I just remember it was wiggling. So uh, not one you would want to eat. So about half the trees I've grown, let them allowed to grow big, turn out to be capra figs, and half were females, and half of those females were pretty good. In fact, we still sell one of those ourselves. Um, I call it Gary Strawberry Fig. So one of the volunteers, one of the first volunteers, well, no, I wasn't the first one, uh, maybe the second volunteer that grew in my yard turned out to be one of the best figs. This is back in the 90s that I'd ever eaten. So, you know, back in the 70s when he first started, when I first started in the business, we just had maybe four figs. Black Mission, Brown Turkey, White Genoa, and Kadoda, which is another white fig. That was all we had, and they were decent, not great. But And then this one started growing in my yard. I go, well, this is better than all those in the early 90s. And we, we, so we started propagating this. Now, the problem when you propagate a fig that grows from the seed is a lot of its offspring tend to be very juvenile. So the first crops of these that we grew from the original plant look, had the snowflake leaves for two or three years before they started making fruit. But as they got, the tree got older and we started taking cuttings off of cuttings that we had grown, the babies of those start producing sooner and sooner. And if the, if the plant is, you know, the original plant is hundreds of years old, it just fruits immediately. And that's been shown to be true on almost all fruiting plants. If you take cuttings off the original tree and citrus, they said the same thing. The babies act like juveniles and may take five years or more to fruit. Whereas if you take a cutting off of a cutting, off of a cutting, off a cutting of the original tree, those tend to just start fruiting immediately. So every cutting you take apparently is genetically over, older than the original plant. I don't know how that works, but that's how it's turning out. Um, oh, so in fertilizer and pots, one of the things we do here um, is use the Osmocote because this one you, you can do once every six months, which may be the entire year for a lot of people um, in a lot of climates. That'll feed them for the whole year, whereas most of the organic fertilizers, which are just fine when using pots, you got to do this every month because every time you water it, some of it flushes out the bottom or some gets washed out, blown off the top of the soil. So you have to fertilize more often. Again, in the ground, a lot of times I just don't fertilize at all. Now, just so you know, the fig family, our ficus family, is huge. So we do grow a lot of different kinds of ficus. This is ficus benjamina, which is an indoor plant. If you grow this enough sunlight, like if you grow it outdoors, they make these little round fig things also. And I've eaten them, and they taste like figs. So they make these little figs. So uh, I saw this Green Beret survival um, literature once, and they said, yeah, any ficus tree you find in the jungle, the figs are good to eat. 
You may have the fig wasp in them, but they're good to eat. Okay, I think I've covered the culture of figs pretty well. I think there are questions on the culture. Okay, that, that's good. So with these big leaves they have, they use a lot of water. Now when they're in the ground and they're established, the root system's so good that they'll still water from far away and you may never have to water them. I mean, there are a lot of wild figs that made it through all the droughts we've had. They do fine. In a container, boy, these things can, with these big leaves, they'll dry out in a day. One summer day, they'll dry out even before the day is out with leaves that big. So you do have to watch them. Now, they, we have seen instances where it's too wet. So if they're in a waterlogged soil, what you'll notice is the leaves start doing this. They just start hanging. And if, they're, if the soil doesn't stop being waterlogged, the new growth gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Their, their roots are dying. And that if they're dry, they don't do this. They just get, they, sometimes they start rolling a bit, but they'll develop brown or white edges around the edge of the leaf where they're drying up. But it's, it's odd, they, when they're too wet, they hang, but when they're too dry, they're staying like this, but they're starting to develop those brown or white tip leaves. They're very resilient. I mean, if you dried out a fig tree, the leaves would fall off, and then it would, when you watered it, it recovers and starts growing again. So they're pretty resilient trees that way. Now, figs can't be grown too far north, like, Canada, it's real hard to find figs that'll live there unless you're on the very coastline. Uh, there are some figs like Chicago Hardy that their main claim to fame is, is they can take Chicago. Uh, most of our figs like warmer conditions. So some of these might make in cool climates too, but most of them like, like our weather here. Okay, so the rise of figs, um, usually the greenish or yellowish figs are called the honey figs. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are sweet and mild. So those are called the honey figs. Um, the most famous is probably... Cadota. So this is called Janus seedless Cadota, but it's a Cadota fig. Now Cadota figs from Italy, and they messed up the name when they brought it here. So the Cadota fig, if you're in Italy, it's the Tota or something of that. The Tota. It's not Cadota. Uh, I believe it's the Tota with two T somewhere in there. So, just like Peking, Beijing, a lot of places get, the names get messed up when they, when somebody doesn't uh, translate it well or doesn't write it down properly. So, this Kadota fig, it's just a sweet fig. It doesn't have much acidity to it. they are big figs. they are big trees on top of that. Um, this is the most popular fig in the Central Valley of California. In the hotter climates of the world, this type of fig is number one because of its sweetness. In Orange County, especially if you live near the ocean, not very exciting. Just because it's, it's not all that sweet. If you don't have, you know, 85, 90 degrees every day, it doesn't pick up as much sweetness to it. So it's still the most famous fig in California, but not not promoted that heavy along the coast. Um, another one, well this is from Persia, Bayadi. It's a famous heirloom from that area of the world. And I'm not sure if it's spelled that way. 
are this way. Uh, I, I think there might be an H in that name, but it's a famous heirloom. It's a large, another large yellowish fig. Uh, a friend of mine married an Italian woman, and their family heirloom, they called it Italian grandmother fig. This is a short tree, which is nice. So it's short with fairly large yellow green figs. Uh, this is interesting. So, sequoia, we'd put in that group. So, this is actually UC Riverside. This is one of their inventions, as is uh, UCR 18725, which never got a proper name. Uh, let's put that down. So they worked 40 years to create Sequoia. There's another one out there called Sierra. Sierra is the uh, more commercial variety. But what they were trying to do was make a fig that resembled the Smyrna figs without needing wasp pollinization. So Smyrna figs are big, sweet figs, not much acidity to them, uh, with the crunchy seeds um, that need wasp pollinization. So Sequoia big light colored figs. They wanted figs that they can grow commercially that they can dry like the Smyrna's are usually dried um, and have the crunchy seeds. And Sequoia is a fairly small tree. My sign says otherwise. Don't listen to the sign. I didn't write the sign. But they said it's about a 10 foot tree. So it's a small tree, big fruit, ripens well near the coast. Uh, Sequoia is one of our top top selling figs if you like the sweet the sweet mellow ones now back in the 80s one of my favorite yellow figs Mary Lane Seedless Mary Lane or Mary Lane Seedless um, this is quite yellow the fruit on this is quite yellow, um, sweet, mild. I really like that. The, of the among the first figs I grew back in the '80s, this was my favorite. Does have the open eye. So open eye figs, um, their potential to get bugs in them and mold in them is higher. So if you're right on the coast, this is probably not the one to grow. Um, some years, like last year, when it was just cool all summer, a lot, a lot of the open eye figs, I've seen the entire fig tree get moldy. Like we used to sell a long time ago, back in the 80s, white Genoa figs. And they had big open eyes. And, some, and most years in my yard, every single fig would get that mold in it where you can't eat it. So we gave up on that one. That was the first one we gave up on was that. Mary Lane, we haven't seen it get moldy as much as the uh, as the white Genoa, but it still potentially can do that. There's another fig that's pretty famous that I put in this group, and that's the yellow long neck. I know we have some in our collection out there, but I I didn't bring one. I guess they're not sprouted well enough yet. Yellow long neck. It's a really big fig, uh, pretty much yellow also, good sweetness, not much acidity, but it does have trouble with our coastal climate. So if it's cloudy over, you know, if the week is 80 degrees sunny the entire week, it's excellent. But if you, got it, if you pick one on a cloudy week, it doesn't have much flavor, so that's one of the problems with it. The further inland you go with this one, the, the better it is. Um, so it is exceptional looking because it's 
like this end is like a tennis ball size. It's, it's a big fruit. Sequoia's big, Bayardi's big. A lot of these are big fruits. Cadota's big too. Okay, so those are the sweet and mild figs. And that's just my opinion. I mean, you look at these fruit from other places of where they grew. You know, if you grow them in different locations, you get different flavors. So it's that's a hard one. Now we do have some we call the berry flavored. Which really means acidic. They've got more acidity to the flesh. And the main one I would say... Oh, well, there's a couple here. So Flanders and Panache. And the one I grew, Gary Strawberry, wherever that went. There. So these, when you bite into them, they pack a punch. They got quite a good acidity. They've got enough sweetness to make it sweet. Um, both, all three of these, the flesh is bright red. Really bright red, especially panache. Now panache is interesting because it is a striped fig. It's a kind of a flat round fruit that as it's growing, it's cream colored with distinct green stripes on it. Pull upside down, looks like one of those striped hot air balloons. The main thing to know about panache is that it does have an open eye. So you can lose the entire crop near the coast, but it is one of the best tasting figs. It does have not only a sharper flavor, I would also say it's cherry. Some years it's very cherry flavored. And the red flesh makes it seem even more so. And the other thing about it, a lot of these striped figs, the branches are already striped. So I don't know if you might not be able to see it, but there's a subtle gold striping on the stems of this tree. Now, they can lose the striping. So on my own panache fig tree, some branches would not be striped and the fruit would not be either. Still tasted about the same, but they lost their striping. And the striping is one of the uh, things that makes this fig so unique. Now the stripes do fade out right when the fruit ripens. But on the tree it's just amazing to look at. Uh, occasionally we get, we can see little variegation in the leaves too from the striping. So that's a, uh, uh, now they say a lot of variegation like stripes are not in the genes of the cell but they're in the genes of the chloroplasts of the plant so it's a little interesting they won't they won't make offspring that are striped but the cuttings are are usually and we have to make sure the cuttings are striped too or else the offspring are just green so these three the flanders is green with some purple veining on it my gary strawberry same thing they're green fruit or the veins of the fruit are kind of purplish. Not stripy looking, more like a net of, of uh, purple on them. Now most of the other figs are somewhere in between the sweet and the acid ones. Um, now between these, I like the panache the best, but again you can have some trouble with it. 
Gary Strawberry and Flanders. Flanders is University of California Riverside also. And they didn't, they're not growing this one commercially, but they said it's so good that they released it to the public in the 1990s. Said, you guys take this, grow it, it's so good. Um, now back in around 1990, when I was growing it, I let a friend, Italian friend of mine who lived down the street, Antonio lived down the street. He had brought figs from his hometown in Vino, Italy. He had a collection of about 40 figs in his backyard. He ate the Flanders at that time and said, this is better than anything in my yard. So he loved Flanders, and I really liked it too. And I, we still think it's one of the best figs out there with the stronger berry or acidic flavor on it. Um, but yeah, he though had a Genoa fig that wasn't like the Genoa figs that we that are being sold commercially here. He had a fig that was huge. I mean, it was it was real big, real flat. It the honey just dripped out the bottom. Just an incredible fruit. Uh, I wish I had a piece of that one, but he was um, he had given to all his relatives first before. I never got a, I never got a piece of his. Okay, so that's the berry flavor ones, and then the rest of the figs are more complex. You can't call them one thing or the other. Um, and again, it's like figs. Every year they taste a little different. Even um, a few days different, you get, you know, some figs are, the inside of the fig is amber, and then you open up and sometimes it's red. The color of the flesh can change, the color of the skin can change, depending on certain conditions. Sometimes we can't predict it. Like uh, the brown turkey type, sometimes they'd be yellow inside, sometimes red inside with different flavors. So the top rated figs of the world, well, the top rated one is, Black Madeira, which is also either the same or really close to Figo Preto. So that's a Portuguese fig from the island of Madeira. Um, unfortunately, our trees, even though it's this early in the year, have been picked over. So most of them are just starting. The most ones I've left are just starting to sprout. But we have plenty of Figo Pretos in stock that look pretty good. So I met someone from the island whose parents came from the island of Madeira. So um, there was a Portuguese. One of the first settlements of the Portuguese fishermen is a Point Loma. Sand near San Diego, and one of my employees uh, had a relative who lived right there, and they remember this fig tree that was in one of the neighbor's yards. They think it was that. They said this was a really good fig tree that he had grown up nearby. So anyway, people from the Hama Madeira, they said we don't call our figs black Madeira or white Madeira. We call them Figo Preto, the dark fig. Because we're from Madeira, we don't call things Madeira, it's just the dark fig. So from the Portuguese um, immigrants, they call it Figo Preto. Whereas everyone else seems to call the same tree Black Madeira. So we think they're the same. They, you know, I got both that are growing ground. The figs look the same, the leaves look the same. So they could be the same, they could be genetically really close anyway that's considered the top fig um it's always usually pretty good so i do like a lot i258 so a few decades or several decades ago a huge collection was brought over from italy and they said, well, no one in Italy names their fig trees. So they just numbered them, and they put them in orchards and test and see which one was best. And one of the top-rated ones was I, Italian number 258. 
So in, I would say last year with our cooler summer, this was the best tasting fig in my collection. In fact, I would say the last two years, I-258 has been the best tasting fig. I do like that a lot. So these are dark figs, although they're quite variable. Sometimes the I-258s will have a lot of green on them. Sometimes they'll be more purplish. Black Madeiras and Figo Prados are usually darker. And they've got uh, a nice sweet. Most of them are large too. Uh, and slightly acidic flavor that gives them some interest in so more complex flavors. I mean, the way a lot of these fig experts describe figs with a little hint of molasses or um, uh, maple syrup flavor, you know, I, I, it's too variable to me to, I just say they taste really good. <laughs> you know, they're good. Now, among these, I would also put I don't know how to pronounce that, Bujasor Grise or Grise, uh, a French fig that's in the same line, seems to be also real good. Not quite as consistent as these are. And then Black Ischia. Now, Black Ischia, we think, started the fig cutting craze about five years, five or six years ago. So we had a tree in the nursery called Black Ish we got from somebody, but we knew it wasn't right because the figs were coming out half green. But people kept asking for cuttings of our tree. We said, no, we don't think this is the right tree. Well, it turns out on the internet, eBay or something, they were selling stems of this to grow to grow, you use this cuttings and grow new trees, $400. So people wanted stems they can buy from us so they can put them on the internet for $400 each. It was just crazy, and that kind of started the whole fig craze, people trading uh, fig cuttings from some of the new figs being brought to the U.S. Now, a lot of figs brought to the U.S. have nasty viruses, so you have to be a little careful with those. Uh, we've had... Some customers say they they ordered some figs. They came in from um, from Europe, and the egg department showed up and confiscated all of them. <laughs> so you have to be careful with some of these. Now, another one we put in the same line, Galicia Negra. Another dark fig that's really, really good. Uh, a lot of these are hard to tell apart. If, if, I was, if they weren't labeled and I was just eating them, they're all really, really good. So those are probably our top ones. I would have to put in here too, cold dead dom. Some people really like these, the cold dead dom ones. And the top rated one is noir, which is the black cold dead dom fig. So cold dead dom figs are a little different than that. This means cold Adam is uh, of the lady, of the collar of the lady, because they've got their shape with somewhat of a neck, and then the figs down here. So they've got this neck on them that looks like the collars that the medieval women used to wear that would accentuate their neck. So the cold Adam figs have, are a little necky like this, and there's a bunch of different ones. They all kind of taste similar. Cold Adam Noir is the dark version. Cold Adam Blanc is the white version. Um, cold Adam Mutante is picks up dark stripes on it. There's uh, quite a few different.
col de dames and they're all quite good a lot of people say they've got a nice texture to them it's the texture i noticed that with noir it's got a very nice almost pastry like texture to it and flavor so the col de dames which we usually um abbreviate cdd noir a blanc or roja or something here's the a cdd noir Oop. so those are the main top figs and then we'll mention some of the more unusual figs now we did mention that the panache is unusual because it's striped but there are some other striped figs out there um i think it's cdd ramada and that looks a lot like the panache fig with the stripes on it so far it hasn't been quite as good but it doesn't have an open eye which helps panache is better but has an open eye so you can lose your crop whereas this one has a tight huh uh it depends on the year the last year it wouldn't have done that well because it was just cloudy and cool and wet all year uh normal years it's okay but I do like the panache a little better than so far. I mean, again, I haven't eaten this enough, many, enough times to tell you that it's not as good as panache. Right now at our drum ground, we've got them right next to each other. So we'll have, if, if the weather holds for us this year, we'll taste this and we'll taste panache and see if one is at the same time, if one is better than the other. Uh, the other stripe fig we have this year well, Mar Martinica Ramada, Ramada apparently means stripes, uh, we haven't seen it do its thing yet. So this one is one of those that's a darker fig, and then it picks up some stripes just as it's ripening. And so far we haven't seen it, it's kind of vague. I've seen in pictures where it's more definite stripes but uh, this one is kind of vague so we're not sure if the plant we have i mean we trust the source though uh that we got the fig from but maybe in our climate it doesn't make the stripes quite as well and then there's another one we have called uh, these haven't sprouted we just got these cuttings so they haven't started growing yet but hopefully later in the year we'll see this one this one is another one that does what the remodel does it's it's a fairly dark fig that develops darker stripes as it's ripening. So that one should be a good one since it's a cold Adam. So those are some of the interesting things that are around. Um, now I do have another fig I really like that's one of the few local figs. So we get volunteer fig cuttings from local customers too. And this one has turned out to be my favorite, Don Satan South. So one of our customers, her neighbor's name is Don Satan. And on the south end of their fence line that they share, this fig tree came up. That's what these two are. These are Don Satan South. And it makes a kind of a creamy brown, light brown colored fig. No faults. It's a large fig. Um kind of flat shaped but it does have a neck on it too but a nice skin that doesn't i never seen a skin split it's got a tight eye I've never seen an open eye on it and it's got good flavor whenever i eat it so i've eaten a lot of don satan south figs off of our trees at the growing ground and i like them i think this is one of my favorite figs too and it's just another local one now um, we do have a friend, David Burke, who is the fig hunter up in Redlands, Redding, excuse me, Redding, California. Um, I 
and he collects figs throughout the Central Valley. Um, his, his company is Burke Family Farms, but it, you look up Fig Hunter on the internet, you'll find his. And he's collected all these local figs from the neighborhoods and put them in a collection. We do have some of his figs. Um, the ones that he says are there are some of their favorite ones called Jolly Rancher because it tastes like the candy. I know we started some cuttings this year, but I'm not buying them. I think someone must have bought them all up already. And then there's another one. They said their taste test winner last year was Kelly Lynn. And I've seen that out there. Um, Shasta Cranberry is another one that's come in really highly rated. So he's got his own collection. Now, the problem we have with figs is that if we don't grow them and eat them here, we don't know if they'll turn out as good as they do in Redding because that's Central Valley heat. So a lot of the figs from up there may not taste the same down here. Uh, but uh, And last year we couldn't taste too many because we didn't have a heat to develop much fruit. So we'll try again this year and see how we do with a lot of those different figs. Another set of figs that's um, useful in some parts of the world, in some parts of the country, LSU, Louisiana State made some uh, fig trees, LSU Purple and LSU Tiger are some that we have grown. Uh, they're decent figs. They're not going to be top rated, but they're decent. But they're selected for the wet, hot, humid, uh, deep south climate that LSU, where LSU is. So you find their trees are more resistant to the rain. So if you live in areas that get, or for some reason get wet leaves, uh, the LSU fig trees will be less likely to get the leaf spots and moldy fruit and stuff like that. Now we do sell one fig that appears to be a Smyrna type that needs the wasp pollinator. That's one called Unknown Pastillary. They call it unknown because a nurseryman, I believe down in the San Diego, ordered some fig trees called Pastilla area, but they didn't come out right. But they were so good that they keep them around, but they just put the word unknown in front of Pastilla area. Uh, so this is about as red a fruit on the outside as you'll ever see. So it's quite red, all for a fig. It's, it's very red. Um, nice fruity flavor. We think it needs to be pollinated by fig wasps. Now there's plenty of fig trees throughout Southern California and California in general. Uh, ficus trees on top of that. So we think the fig wasps are out there. So about half to two-thirds of the fruit that develops on there ripens without any th anyone doing anything. A lot of it does turn yellow and fall off. So we think it is one that needs a, a wasp pollinator, but it, for the most part it gets it. And uh, quite a visually unique medium size, not huge, maybe about this big, but very nicely flavored fig. And then we also sell a version of the original Black Mission called Vista Black Mission. And the difference between it and the original is that the, I thought I brought it up, oh yeah, is that on most figs, the space between the leaves and where they're making the fruit, on the original Black Mission, it might be a foot or more between the leaves on the branches. On the Vista Black Mission, they're like, inches apart each leaf so the tree seems to make more fruit on each branch closer together uh, the trees grow just as tall I mean they'll grow over 20 foot tall 
but everything's more close together and seems to be worth it. They, the flavor, you can't tell any distance in the flavor. In Black Mission, uh, the bourbon crop is big. The real, the normal crop is medium size, and then at the end, very end of the year, the figs that they ripen are quite small. Black Mission was originally brought to California in the what 1500s from the uh, Spanish missions that came up. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> now, so we grow most of our figs in pots. Um, five gallons, not a very good size for a long period. They tend to grow five gallons in a year or two. Um, a lot of our customers grow them either 15 gallon or 20 gallon or sometimes even bigger pots. One reason we grow them in a pot is if you grow them in the ground and you try to get rid of them, they keep re-sprouting and re-sprouting and re-sprouting from the root system. So if you keep them in a pot, uh, you'll get quite a few figs on a pot this size. You might get 30 or 40 during the year, and you, and you can control it, keep it from uh, invading the rest of your garden. Um, they generally in, in pots, 10 years is about max for any plant. And it's easy to start a new cutting to start a new plant when, when that one get, starts getting old. So. Uh, question was, yeah, she's got a volunteer fig that's not very tasty. You can graft them, uh, but it's so easy to grow cuttings that grafting is more difficult than growing a cutting from a branch. So if someone, if you get a fig from another cut, you know, even in the summertime, now fig, spring is not the easiest time to take cuttings once they make their leaves because they their energy was already used to make this. But summer, fall, winter, you can take a branch with leaves on it cut it and stick it in a pot and usually it grows at least here in southern california usually it grows i had a friend do that show me how it works so he took cutting off this is like august stuck it in the container with good potting soil in it and within a few days of course it was totally wilted come back a week later it was growing i couldn't believe it, it, it it's so quick to root that even though it looked terrible the first week by the second week, it was growing and, and already, you know, it already made roots in that short a time. So you can take cuttings almost any time of year except for spring, unless you, you know, you start an older branch that just hasn't sprouted yet. Because, you know, this, a section of this branch should grow if you have a cutting that long and stick it in a pot. Now, just so you know, we, have our own potting soil that we consider permanent. Our acemix in our top pot, uh, our acemix holds more more moisture because it's got more peat in it. Of course, peat moss tends to shrink over time, but with fig trees, um, the volume of roots they make is so much that that usually you don't see the soil shrink, even in our acemix or our top pot, because they're making up the volume as they grow. We start cuttings in our acemix. Our acemix with just peat and, uh, uh, and volcanic rock is considered a sterile medium, so we get better take on the cuttings. Uh, top pot has some unsterilized sand in it, so potentially there might cause a bit of rotting on cutting, so we use our acemix for cuttings. So all our one gallon plants are in our acid mix. Uh, and then we put them in bigger pots. Generally, we switch to the top pot, but either one works. All right, thank you.